And we welcome to a more than just a podcast another West Ham legend after Tony Cotty last week. It's Alvin Martin, or uh, also known as Stretch, which we'll talk about later. So, Alvin, apparently 598 games, 34 goals, 19 years as a professional at West Ham. Welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, sounds a long time, doesn't it? <laughs> it, do, it does sound a long time. Uh, we were talking to uh, Tony Cotty last week, and uh, we were talking about the... Uh, the season of 86, I'm sure we'll get uh, involved in that later because that, that was uh, one of your eras as well. Yep. So let's start with um, where you were born because I understand, and I hope this is right, you were born in Liverpool, rejected by Everton, um, and yet you, you ended up uh, as a, an apprentice from one of the academy boys at, at West Ham. How did that happen? That's right, yeah. I played for a team on a Saturday, most of us did. I like, used to play for the school on a Saturday morning. In the Saturday afternoon, I, I played for um, a pub team. And uh, one of the chaps who ran the pub team, um, John McBride, had a contact at West Ham. Uh, and Everton had sort of dragged their heels over, offering me something good of it. And when they eventually did, I'd already made my mind up that I was going to um, take a chance on coming down and have a trial at West Ham. So I actually did. I actually did that in 74, the summer of 60. Sorry, uh, the summer of 74, July, about uh, three months after Moro left, uh, I arrived for a trial, a two-week trial. So um, I actually went to QBR first, and they couldn't make their mind up, and they asked me to come back uh, for a further two weeks. But I was going to West Ham the following day. So I said, look, can I come back in two weeks? Uh, I didn't tell them. Obviously, I was having a trial at West Ham. They said, yeah, no problem. Uh, but when I'd actually uh, spent the two weeks at West Ham, within, I think, a week, Ron Greenwood had offered me a, a full apprenticeship. Excellent. And it, and it obviously went on from there. So I've, on my information research, I've got that your debut was on 18th of March 1978 when you came as a substitute as, uh, against Villa. Is that right? I'll have to take your, your word for the case. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. I think um, we were 3-1 down. I came on as a centre forward uh, and the game ended up being 4-1. So I made an, an immediate impact. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you about your memory. So what, what is your most memorable or proud moment in a West Ham shirt? What, what game would you pick? I think the, the 1980 Cup final is the one that I've always, went, you know, that's the one that uh, everyone talks about. That's the game that, you know, we, we went in as underdogs at Wembley. And it's the first massive game. When I say massive, it was, uh, I think, a lot bigger than the FA Cup final than it is now. So it was a, you know, it was a, it was a pivotal moment in, in my career. I think I'd had a good season that year, fully established myself. I think I won Hammer of the Year, which I was always very proud of, of that honour. But then when we went into the FA Cup final, obviously it's, it's, it's a game that can make or break young players. I was 21 at the time. Um, and fortunately it went well for all of us it, it was just a, a fantastic experience but one that just came and went before we you know before I certainly uh, uh, knew knew it was it was upon us I remember Billy Bond speaking to me um, before the game I think a couple of days before saying you know take it all in it's a, it's a wonderful experience he said in the first time round he captained the team in 1974 um, he said it, it all went past me too quickly so he gave me a little bit of a hint to to, to try and take it all in and remember it, but unfortunately, once the, the, day, the day started, it was a, it was so fast, ferocious, pressurised that you tend to just uh, get swept along by it. Yeah, well, I, I I don't remember a lot about the game. I did watch it um, as a very young child, but uh, obviously I've watched it again several times uh, since. We were talking to David Cross last season, and, and we asked him the question: Did Trevor Brooking mean to head of that goal in? And his answer was yes. What 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 is your take on that? Yeah, I think he did. I think he did. I think he actually directed it. Um, I think if, if if Trevor would have been asked to win a, a ball in the air on the halfway line with a chance of getting a whack on his nose or a cut eye, I think he might have actually declined. But to score a goal, um, I think he, he he proved that he could head a ball. But no, I, I've got no doubt in my mind. I think he actually changed his body shape to be able to redirect that in. It wasn't a great. It was. It was it Stuart Pearce or was it David Cross smack, smacked it across? Uh, I thought it was David Cross, yeah, but it again, I, I tell Crossy that it was a terrible effort. <laughs> I will do. We we do talk to him from time to time. Um, so I understand your nickname when you were at West Ham was Stretch, but I, I I've got no idea why. I I was in Diggs when I first came down as an apprentice in the uh, Plasto, uh, just uh, opposite the Greengate pub, uh, Dongler Road, and I was only there for the trial period, and then I went to um, East Ham, Lonsdale Avenue, right at the top of the Barkham Road there, uh, where the bowling pub is. So I was in there for, I think, 18 months, and uh, I was in digs with a fellow called Keith Robson, Mad Keith Robson, who was a Geordie, a uh, very good player. But he was, uh, I think he was 21 at the time, and I was 16, something like that anyway. He was the elder statesman in the first team, and I was sharing digs with him. And I was always sitting on the floor, eating me chocolate, watching TV, 
Uh, and he'd stay in on a Friday. That was the only night he did stay in. And I think his, his idea of a night in was getting six uh, cans of Newcastle Brown Ale to drink uh, prior to the game. He wasn't the, the most disciplined. But I was uh, I was in digs li- lying around the floor. And he used to call me stretch. He, he, he was the first one to call me. It, and uh, it just stuck. You know, in them days, any, any dressing room, any football club, if you've got a nickname... Um, it, and, and it sort of went on for like two or three days it stuck for the rest of your career and that's what it did Yeah, well, I don't know if you've been back to Plasto recently but the Greengate pub we used to drink at uh, before the game has recently been turned into a Tesco's uh, they've shut down the Castle pub that was opposite that's uh, changing I think to a Greengrocer's right. uh, and uh, you might know the Bolin pub's up, up for um for sale as well, so you know the. You well, it's a changing place, but I thought it was a, it was a great place for me. That you know, the first two years, um, seventy four to seventy six, when you know we play, I was playing in the youth team. We had a particularly good youth team: Alan Kerrisley, Paul Brush, Terry Haylock, uh, Jeff Pike. You know, there were some good good players in that team. We got to the the, uh, the the FA Youth Cup final that year, but we'd go on out on a Saturday night, um, usually into Stratford or uh, into to Plasto. Uh, there's some great pubs around there. Uh, I, I loved living around the East End in, in them days. It was fantastic. Yeah. So I'm going to move on to, uh, I'm sure, a question you get asked all the time, and I brought it up on my blog only last week when we played Newcastle, and that's your, your famous pub quiz question. Maybe you should get royalties each time this is asked as <laughs> a pub quiz, which is obviously when we beat Newcastle 8-1, uh, you scored a hat-trick. Well, the question is, who scored a hat-trick against three different goal um, uh, goalkeepers? Um, and yeah, I, I mean, uh, bizarre. And I, I've been watching it recently on YouTube. I mean, uh, can, you, can you share the experience of that day? Well, it was just an incredible game, really. I mean, we were fighting obviously all the way through that season for the title. You know, we were into into, into the last what seven or eight games of the season, and you know, we felt we had a chance still. Uh, Liverpool, Everton, and ourselves were all we're all there or thereabouts. And that game, really, we didn't know what to expect. I think we were getting incredibly tired by that stage because we'd had a fixture backlog. And uh, there was all of these games coming thick and fast on top of each other. Uh, but I remember the game, and you know the game was, was strange. I think it was it, there was a relief there because with the the three points were always the most important thing at that stage of the season. Um, and I think once you get to like sort of five or six one, you know the game's won. You can relax and enjoy the game. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until I came off the pitch um, and went out to do the interviews. I thought they were just going to interview me about you know a normal hat trick. And it was Trevor Smith who, who wrote for the recorder at the time. He said, you know that every goal was scored against a different goalkeeper? And I honestly didn't know. It was, it was, it was strange. Uh, obviously, he'd, he'd clocked it as a journalist. And then, um, obviously, that's, that, that's something that happened that uh, I, I would have thought it would be very lucky to be repeated again. That is for sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I can't see that being repeated in, in, in the modern game. Um, you, you talked about Billy Bonds earlier. You spent a lot of your career with Billy Bonds in the centre. Um, more of a modern question, but um, since you retired, who, who would you put put down as your your best centre defender in that position? What in the modern game? Yeah, well, in West Ham, you know, since you've left from the time you retired onwards, who yeah. who do you think? Rio, Rio was the one. Rio was just coming through as I was getting to the age I was, I thirty seven at the time. So I knew that you know um, it was it was coming to the end for me, and it was a young kid in the reserves uh, that I'd watched train and, and 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 develop, and I knew that he was going to be a real player. And I remember speaking to Harry Redknapp about him, saying, you know, I played in a reserve game and, and I was, I think we played against the Arsenal at, at Old Highbury and he, he'd marked uh, Ian Wright, who was playing in this reserve game at the time, out of the game. And I remember he really impressed me, not just with the fact that he defended well against Rio, but he, he had composure as well, a brilliant athlete. And uh, he's, he's definitely somebody that, um, I was surprised really that somebody didn't take him earlier on. I think he went to Leeds and then went to Manchester United. Yeah. I was always a little surprised that Man United didn't come for him before Leeds did. And of course, there's a lot of paper talk at the moment that he might, you know, have one last hurrah back at West Ham and, and have one last season. I'm not sure about that. I'm not, you know, I don't know if that, that, that is the right thing. I know that uh, it, it'd be up to, to Sam Allardyce in the club, but, uh, you know, I don't know when you get to a certain age whether um, it's, it's right to go back. I think that uh, Rio's biggest asset was his pace. Um, and unfortunately, that's the first thing that starts to go. So then, you know, you, you have to start reading the game and playing and evolving and developing your own personal game. So I'm not so sure it would be the right move for West Ham, or, or for Real. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so you mentioned earlier, you won Hammer of the Year, uh, and I believe you've won it, again, if my research is right, three times. So that, that's a feat only equaled by Bobby Moore, Billy Bonds, and, and more recently Scott Parker. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, Mark Noble won it last year. 
Um, but on, on the performance so far, who, who would you have pegged down as, as Hammer of the Year this year and, and runner-up as Hammer of the Year? Well, I've, I've only been to the one game this year. That was against Manchester City, and uh, the, the player who caught my eye that day uh, was Reid, playing at the back. Um, he showed a lot of um, composure, tenacity, reading of the game, uh, good athlete. So he, he was somebody, I looked at him and I thought, you know what, he could be, he could be a real player. Um, obviously, what you don't want to do, you don't want to get carried away with somebody too early, but um, for, the, for the one game I've seen live, um, and I, I think to give a real opinion on players, you need to see them live in the flesh. Yeah. Uh, he was the one that caught my eye. and I know that Mark Noble and Kevin Nolan have, have, have been receiving a lot of plaudits, but certainly as an ex centre half, uh, Reid is somebody that's certainly going to be in the running. Yeah, you know, I, I absolutely agree. He's getting a lot of plaudits, along with uh, Momo Diarmi as well, as, as a, a good find as well. Yeah, I think the, the the side that Sam's put together is, is, is it, it seems to be a proper team. You know, I think sometimes people assemble teams, and you know, even going back to Liverpool and Tottenham not so long ago, you know, they were lots of individuals, and didn't seem to be any balance there. No thought to, to whether they could all complement each other. But at the moment, uh, you know, the likes of Diarmi and Noble and uh, and Nolan and Reed at the back with Collins, um, uh, McCartney steady. Uh, you know, so from that point of view, there's there's a team there, and there's there's a togetherness and. And an, an, organis- an organisation that possibly you know you, you can't you can't do well consistently without it. Yeah, well, we're obviously we're at a heady seventh place with, with 18 points. We played Stoke tonight. Could go fifth because uh, we're recording this on the Monday. Yeah. Um, I mean, where do you think we're, we're finished this season? Well, I, I don't think it'd be fair to put too much pressure on the, on the side finishing anywhere near where they are at the moment. There's going to be some tough games coming up. Uh, we're going into them with a lot of confidence. Uh, the one tonight against Stoke is a different type of game, isn't it? You know, they've, they've got a good draw against Man City. That was definitely a point game. Could have been all three if, uh, if the goal had been stood by Kevin Nolan. But uh, tonight will be a difficult game. But, you know, we are going into it, like I say, with a, a lot of confidence. And uh, I think the great thing for me was, was going to the game, so I don't get over there that often now, was, uh, was the atmosphere against Manchester City. Yeah. It was fantastic. And if that's the same again tonight, that's a massive plus for the players. And they've obviously, uh, the performances are, are keeping the fans behind them. But there will be some tougher games coming up. There'll be a run of games where it doesn't go well. And I think that's where you've got to dig in. You've got to actually then find your way out of a bad, uh, bad spell. I think he's got the experience to be able to do that, Sam. And the players look like, I say, they, they've got some leaders in the dressing room now. So uh, yeah. from that point of view, if they were to finish like 12th, I think it would be a very good season. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it's a dark Monday night. I don't know what Sky was thinking of when they, they had uh, West Ham and Stoke on a Monday night, but I guess they've all got to get a bite of the cherry. Yeah. Uh, but we have sold out. You know, there's only a few singles left tonight. So, you know, for, for a, a match that's on Sky, cold, wet, dark, you know, it's good that the fans are coming out to support well, West Ham. I, I just love night games at Upton Park. I just love them. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the, some of the, the biggest memories I've got are the night games. Yeah. Uh, I remember one particular quarter final uh, would have been 1981 I think against Spurs uh, there would have been you'll have to look it up because uh, I, I don't know how many people were there but it would have been in excess of 40,000 and in the in the game I remember standing in the actual tunnel when the old band used to be there we used to have like a brass band that walked out with us and they were all getting, getting in our way a lot of the time but we went to go out and the atmosphere was electric there was a buzz like you know that you couldn't hear each other during the game we were trying to communicate you know communication is a big part of football you know, you just couldn't hear anyone who was like ten yards away from you. It was it was unbelievable. We won the game one nil. That was the year we went on to uh, to get to the final of the League Cup. But I remember them nights at Upton Park under the lights were always special for me. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you've read um, uh, the article in uh, in the Sun today by Alan Shearer talking about Big Sam. No, I didn't. No. So I mean, Alan's talking about that. Um, it, you know, that Sam's not all hoofball and long ball, and it's a bit unfair, and it's about time the West Ham fans sung his name uh, I mean we did briefly sing his name we sang Ala 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 Dice the, the tune of Paradise from Coldplay at the playoff final at Wembley but I think uh, Alan's got a small point that we haven't been singing uh, you know Clarent Blue Army like we would you know in the old days of yeah. Johnny Lyle um, I mean what, what's your view on the whole hoofball and you know that uh, you know Big Sam's misunderstood etc I think there's, there's no doubt about it. We do play direct. I think when you've got somebody like Andy Carroll, I think that's, that's going to be a strength of your team. So you have to play the ball up there to a certain degree. If, you see, if I had seen Andy Carroll um, with, with, and I could see his chest from 40 yards away, I would be looking to hit his chest and then knowing that he can bring it down and, and play people in. And that, If you can actually do that, that's hard to play against. I know as a, as a centre-half, if, if you get a good quality service into somebody like Andy Carroll, 
um, people are running off him. It, they, you have all amount of problems. So that, you know that's 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 a very good way of playing football. I think you know what they have done. I think they mixed it up a little bit. Um, I think you've got people like uh, Benny Yoon. I was pleased to see play against Manchester City. Mark Noble. They can pass and play the ball as well. But if you're going to play uh, for goals, then the obvious way to play with with, with Nolan actually joining and just playing off the front man is to hit quality and the, the way he is quality ball into uh, into Andy Carroll. If you're just hoofing it up there and it's all fighting for the ball and whatever it is and you're just relying on set pieces and long throws, I think that can be a different ball game. You know, um, but I think overall, I think the, uh, the the mixing up of the style has been okay this year. You know, long, long may it continue. I think they're playing with a lot of confidence. They're causing people problems. Uh, but I, I wouldn't judge Big Sam this early on in the season. I think what we've got to do is look where we are you know, into February, March, and they say, OK, where are we? Are the teams still playing with a lot of confidence? And, and are we still enjoying watching it? But at the moment, you're, you've just said it, there's a sellout at Upton Park against Stoke, not one of the glamour teams. So we can't be doing that bad. Yeah, no, we're, um, we're enjoying watching it. And uh, I met Big Sam last Monday. I was at the Supporters Advisory Board, uh, and Big Sam came as a surprise guest and did an hour question and answer, and, and I asked him, uh, and I, well, I said, first of all, you weren't everyone's cup of tea, but everyone's warming to you. And, and the whole uh, room... Uh, applauded Sam for what he did last season, what he's doing this season. So I think, you know, it wasn't everybody's cup of tea when he was appointed, but I think everybody's warming to him uh, and think he's done a, a really good job. Well, I think it's better than coming in and doing well initially and then um, and then and then falling away. Give me get same with the player. I'd rather a player come in and struggle initially and then win the players, uh, win the fans and the players round because. Uh, you know that's that's the longevity. That's that's the future. Football isn't about doing well for one season, though. You know that's what I would say. Yeah. It's about doing well for five for ten for, for ten, ten seasons, and that's why you know you see a player do well for one year. Um, where is he going to be in three years' time? You know the, the proper players are the ones that are there in ten, twelve years' time if they're lucky, and they've been producing it because I think when you produce a decent performance one season, the fans expect that level of performance the following season. That's that's the real challenge. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. So um, you've already mentioned you don't get to see West Ham very often. Um, you, you've got two boys, haven't you, that are both footballers. Uh, did they get the West Ham bug? Or, um, well, it was a strange thing. I, I, I sometimes regret, that's the one regret I've got with their careers, that, you know, that maybe if they'd have been at West Ham, um, they, they could have actually been further ahead than where they are at the moment. Uh, it was a, a catalogue of, of incidents that actually made them actually take a different route. Uh, there was things going on at West Ham that the satellite... Um, uh, coaching schools and the, I think Tony Carr was was having problems with with a few a few of the the uh, the satellites I think they were called um, sort of uh, structural sort of like coaching sessions and, and and they just happened to to go into Tottenham no other bigger reason really than that, that, that all of the friends that they were with um, were, were also at Tottenham so you know at that age of what ten nine or ten I think it was it was easy for them to do that and to you know, to, to go with their mates. So, you know, I didn't think that, to be fair, either of them were going to make it. You know, it's too early to say it, 9 and 10. Uh, but they ended up going to Tottenham, and it was a, it was a mistake, really. I think if they'd have been at um, West Ham under Tony Carr and his coaches, I think that both of them would have um, certainly progressed a lot quicker than they have done now. I've still got great hopes for both of them. Mm. Dave's at MK Dons. He's played 200 games now. And uh, Joe was really starting to make a mark at Gillingham as an attacking left-back. So, you know, I do feel that they've both got good futures in the game. But, like I say, I do regret, that's the one regret that they're... Uh, I wasn't able to get them under Tony Carr's um, stewardship at West Ham. Well, you never know. We might still, still see them in a West Ham shirt in the future. I'm touching wood if you say that. <laughs> right. Uh, final question. Uh, obviously, the uh, proposed move to the Olympic Stadium is dragging on and on and on. Uh, we, we've been asking players, celebrities and normal fans exactly where they sit with it. And it's, it's something that's been uh, you know, splitting the fans. Where, where do you sit in this whole debate on, on moving to the Olympic Stadium? Well, my initial reaction is, why? Um, unless the, the, the stadium is going to offer our fans the same sort of um, uh, viewing that they've got at Upton Park, I think it's a unique uh, stadium that we've got. I understand some of the downfalls, you know, the, the downside is getting in and out of the ground, that's always been a pain, even when I was playing. So I understand that, but you know, we've got corporate facilities, just built a new stand, the West Stand, uh, the pitch is really close. The atmosphere, as I mentioned earlier on in the interview, is, is as good as it's certainly the best at, by far in London, in my opinion. And it goes some way to being in the top set of five, certainly five in the country for atmospheres. And I, I think we've always used that to, to, to good advantage. So there are lots of reasons to stay where we are. Now, if somebody can convince me that the Olympic Stadium is right from the fans' point of view, from the viewing point of view, from the financial point of view, where you know that we're going to have a, a, a long term plan where the, where the club are going to own that stadium somewhere along the line, then fine. 
But at this moment in time, I haven't got all of the details of the new stadium. So while I don't want to be overcritical of the Olympic uh, Stadium sort of venture, I, until I've, I actually find out everything about it, you know, I wouldn't back it. I wouldn't back it, not until I'm absolutely certain that it's good for West Ham fans. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have that same view, and, and I, I believe, I, as I say, I sit on the, the supporter advisory board, um, and we have seen the plans, but I, I agree, the quicker those plans can be made available to all, all fans um, after the decision's made, then I think then people can make a, an informed judgment after that time. Yeah, I, I definitely intend to, to, to look into the detail of the stadium and, 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 uh, and speak to people, West Ham fans I'm talking about now, about the, the, the integral issues that, that, that surround the stadium and the move from our, our stadium where we are now. So I do intend, over the, certainly over the next couple of months, to, to, to pay a lot more attention to that. Excellent. Well, thank you for answering our questions. I know you're, you're on Talk Sport. Uh, you've joined Twitter at Alvin Martin 58, if I'm correct. What, what other projects are you up to at the moment? Uh, well, it's just mainly just I, I, I think watching the boys. I mean, obviously uh, heavily in like, as we all are into our families and watching the boys play. You know, every week now. Um, my daughter's just had a, a grandchild. Joe, my youngest one, just had a grandchild. Uh, sorry, I've glad just had two. Yeah, that was it. My grandchild. But like, you know, th- that, that tends to to take a lot of time up. But I'm doing two or three days a week on, on talk sports. The rest of it's all to do with the family. And uh, I'm just enjoying life. It's fantastic. I've spent quite a bit of time in Spain now uh, with my wife. So, you know, from that point of view, if you'd have said to me when I was a skinny 16-year-old going into West Ham in 1974, this is where you're going to be when you're, you're 54, um, then I would have bitten your hand off. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Excellent. Well, you have been our West Ham legend on more than just a podcast. Thanks very much for talking to us, Alvin. Thanks, mate. Cheers.